Good afternoon, everyone from the Eastern Time Zone, and hello, everyone else. Um, I'm really excited to um, introduce our superstar presenter today, Mael Salman. She's a research software engineer and a blogger based in France. Um, I enc I've encountered her on and off again through multiple platforms. She's part of the Our Ladies Global team. She's part of our OpenSight peer review team. And she's wherever our uh, software development happens. And today she's going to be talking to us about um, our package development. I will throw in the links uh, to the Google document where you can post your questions and introduce yourself. But also that document will have the necessary URL to the GitHub repository and the website that we will be using for today's demo and presentation. Thank you everyone for being here. And welcome again, Mile. We are super excited to have you here. Thank you, sorry, we'll start uh, sharing my screen. Thank you for the lovely introduction. And to answer Stephanie's question in the chat, yes, I like seeing faces when I present. And if anything uh, starts being too fast and too unclear, please interrupt me. I, I don't want to, to lose uh, anyone's. So I'm going to share all screen. So you can see everything now, right? Cool. Um, so <laughs> the topic of the meetup today is become an R package developer. Uh, I'm joining from Nancy in France. So this is uh, what, like the people that know Nancy in France, that's what they picture. So this very small part of the town where it's all very fancy and very golden. So this is not where <laughs> exactly where I live, but you can imagine I live here. And the sky is actually often gray, but we had a very sunny day today. Um, so I wanted to start to, um, by explaining why I like, that I like package development, not uh, to do any self-promotion or something like that, but just to show that it's really a, a topic that I enjoy. So um, as uh, Janani mentioned, I'm a volunteer editor for our OpenSight software peer review, where we uh, review our packages. So AdFork also maintains our OpenSight dev guide, which is a guide for the software peer review, but that other package developers can use. I created the R Hub blog. So in the R Hub blog, we are post about very niche and also less niche topics related to package development. And I worked in the HTTP testing in R book. So this is <laughs> for when you write a package uh, interfacing um, a web resource, such as a web API or something like that. Um, so why would you develop an R package? So maybe you have some sort of motivation because you, you came here today. But uh, so the first reason is that it's the easiest way to share your code, your data, your R Magnum templates with you now, you in a few days, in a few weeks, the collaborators you know, like your colleagues, and also other people in the world that might find your work um, interesting for their own needs. And why would you learn about package development? So I really like the wording of John Cutter who says that, so not only you, you want to learn about package development for sharing your code and data, like I just explained, but it's also useful because it can help you leverage existing tooling. So maybe once you learn that you can uh, write, for instance, the dependencies in a file called description, maybe you will do that elsewhere. Um, and it can help you contribute to other packages, like packages that you use. So you don't really want to create your own package, but maybe you can help tweaking existing packages and tweaking and, per and developing further. So that's why it's useful to know these things. And who can write a, a package? Or is this uh, like for only for a certain type of people? Well, let's see. I'm using the words um, of a presenter at an Ali's meetup. I can't read, or I think it was an Ali's meetup. So Susan Johnston wrote that if you can open R or R Studio, if you can install a package, if you either written a function in R, like only one, or if you could learn how to write a function in R, then you are perfectly able to write a package in R. So I think this means that everyone can write a package in R. And so one key uh, information on this slide was that you need to learn about functions. So last month there was a, a meetup at LADC Lansing and Chicago um, about functions. So you could uh, revise this, with this uh, tutorial and I've also put link here and on the course uh, website uh, with all the resources for learning about functions. But today I will, I, like I, I will assume that either you already know about functions uh, and, or, and also that it's not uh, that big of a problem because I'm not going to use 
a very complicated function. And I'm only uh, going to use one. <clears throat> and, and this paper, as I've just said, it could still uh, sound a bit scary to create a package. It will definitely be some sort of milestones in your R journey. Like you will say, oh, in 2021, I wrote my first R package. That's important. But you don't need to be afraid. So Sebastian Rochette wrote that to be less afraid, you have to tell yourself that a package is simply a folder organized in a constrained way. So like uh, with a place for code, a place for dependency, that kind of things. Now, it's still a bit um, puzzling when you're a beginner because you're like, wait, well, but, well how do I learn how this, uh, where these things live? So thankfully, you don't even need to remember all the organization rules because you can automate part of the package uh, development workflow. So you can automate most of the things, maybe not all of them. So if you've used Excel in the past, maybe you remember Clippy. So Clippy was this uh, small thing uh, trying to help you when you use Excel. So there is a useful and actually useful Clippy for our package developer, it's a use this package. So to use this package will help you streamline your package development workflow. In the words of Jenny Bryan, who maintains uh, the use this package with Hadley Wickham, so use this package implements this important principle, automate that which can be automated. Your computer was literally born to implement rule by fussy stuff for you. So, and the use this package is very useful and that's what we're going to, to use today. And what are my goals for today? So I, I want you to, to get to know the, what I think, or many people think as the best tool for package development. So at least the one uh, that many people use. Then uh, also to learn that there is no magic so that uh, to become a better package developer, what counts is well practicing, of course, but also having an idea of the tools and tips that are out there so that you can use them, use them along the way. And lastly, I would like to um, help you think about whether you would want to contribute to open source packages. Uh, and I wanted to show you the website. So I think this, is, this link will be written somewhere in the chat or in the Google Doc. So that's where all the things for today are. So there is several. And so we are at the intro. Just, we are in the slide deck. So here are the notes from the demonstration, including notes for me. So you will see it's written that I need to slow down. So I really need to slow down and not be too fast during the demonstration. And we will go um, also through these two sections. So our slide decks here. And this is a page, the resources page is a page with further resources about certain topics. And when I will make things appear by like by magic in my RCG session, so I actually going to copy paste from this snippets page because I don't think I can improvise writing simple stuff and doing a live demonstration. Um, did I write comments? I think you can leave comments on the here, but since we have a Google Doc today, it's easier that if, if you have questions that you leave them uh, in the Google Doc. So now it's time for a demonstration. So I've, as I've just said, there are notes on the course website. Um, so let's go. Um, so here is an R Studio session. So I hope you're at the bit familiar with the R Studio interface. I don't think I've customized anything here. So that's the default display and default colors. So to develop um, a package, so I, I first wanted to mention that it's good to sort of know where the installed packages live uh, in your computer. So you could um, type that in your R session and go and see uh, at these folders if you can see their installed packages. So just to to have an idea. I actually don't do that very 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 often. So now to install pa uh, to um, develop packages with their their popular tools. So sorry. So what you we need to do is install the DevTools package. So I've already installed it, so I'm not going to, to do that now. And there are also over part of setup and in the R packages book, there um, is an explanation of the different setup steps that uh, might happen. And once you've done them, there are a few functions that can help you 
access whether there is any anything amiss on your on your system. So that's good to know before you start uh, developing packages. So there is a function in DevTools called as devil. So it returns this to me. Your system is ready to build packages. So I hope that it will be the case for you if you're trying to, to do that. Then there is another one. Uh, dev tool dev ctrip. So ctrip is means situation report. I think that's a military phrase or something like that. And it will also inform you of things that could be better or are already optimal. So it tells me that I have a few dependency uh, out of date. Um, I saw that earlier, but I decided not to update the dependency five minutes before the live demonstration. And then if we're, so if you're going to use a uh, version control, you can also use another ctrip function and you use this package, you have the git uh, ctrip. Um, sorry, I'm going to write this here because this was very... So a lot of text here, I'm not going to go into the details, but if you see, for instance, here, I need to vaccinate my um, system. So if you see this kind of things, it means there, there is something that you can uh, go explore and there will be a useful hints. So this, were, this is why these functions are, are so good. So that's uh, one thing. Then I wanted to, to show you a setup I have in my R profile. So what is an R profile? So when R starts, you can uh, ask R to run code. So every time you start R with a file called an R profile and to open it and edit it. So the easiest way is to use a use list function again. So it's called edit R profile because this will know where the R profile is. So this is my R profile. So this is an option, something that we don't need today for debugging. What's important when you start developing packages are this option here. So the option for, for use this. And in particular, it tells my name and the way I want my name to be written in packages that I create. So how did I know um, uh, what to put here? So I really like to uh, oh. So here uh, on the use this uh, package down website, there is um, an old page called setup. And in this old page, so one part is mm, here telling you how to uh, customize your R profile for use this to know your name and, and this kind of things. And you might think this is a whole wall, uh, wall of text for things for you to do before you start developing packages. And it's true that setup has never, ever been fun. So that might sound a bit painful. And it's also hard because these are new things. But uh, this documentation is actually quite well written. And you can, can also ask others a uh, question if, that, um, if something isn't clear. And setup is also something that you only do once. And if you have to do setup a second time, it should also be easier because you've already not done it once. So if you find it painful today, that's completely understandable that setup is not fun. And I pr promise that this should get better with time. Uh, so these are the option for use this here. And I also have this, um, uh, this part of my R profile that says that if I start R, in an interactive session, like now, I want to load all these packages. So I'm loading the refresh package. This is not useful now. I'm loading the DevTools package every time I, I load R, and this also loads the use this package. And these two are also not uh, needed today. But this means that the functions from, the, from these packages are always available uh, for me because they help my workflow um, in R. So there was a lot of things about setup, so now about package. Um, are there any questions about the setup? No, okay, so. Um, Mael, there was a quick uh, comment that um, someone was requesting you to increase the oh, width yes. of your co console and your um, yeah. terminal, yeah. yeah. No, probably. 
Uh, Stephanie has a question as well. Can you unmute yourself, Stephanie? I think you said Stephanie, so I'll ask my question. Jenny, can you hear me? It will will okay. this be enough? Like this? Jenny, was that the... Yes, yes, that works. Yes, okay. sorry, I, I didn't I realize I was um, oh. So my own, I have a question um, and looking at your R profile file, mm -hmm. um, do you recommend, so the options that you have about um, running Reprex, et cetera, dev tools, do you recommend that people put these into their R profile if uh, they're developing packs? Yes, if you are a Reprex guard or lookup user, I recommend doing that. So there packages that you should not put here as the one that really helps your analysis. So for instance, if you use um, our, any of the tidy models packages for your modeling, you wouldn't put them here because then you would have like uh, your analysis code and results and it would be impossible for uh, people to know where their functions can come from because you're loading the packages elsewhere. So that's the kind of, kind of thing you shouldn't do in your R profile or changing option that might uh, influence results of your computation. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Um, okay, so now let's create a package and I want to uh, call it, or I need to check that's a good name. I'm not sure uh, if that's available on my own computer, but the, uh, no, <laughs> okay. So I'm going to uh, create a package called mini package two because the last time I gave this tutorial, I, I created one called mini package. I can't do that now. Um, and in general, when you create a package, you think of a cool name for your package. You should, um, if you want it to be something else that, that an example package, it's better that it's the, if it's the only one with this name, so you can run a function in a, the avail, available package. So that's some friends available package and it has a function called available and you would type the name of your package like this just to see if there is any package on CRAN or by a conductor or GitHub with this name. And if you want, it can also query uh, urban dictionary um, results for you. That can be important. Like I'm not a native speaker, so I could choose um, a package name that's actually an offensive word in English. I'm still going to say no here just because it will be quicker. Oh, why? Okay. And it also opens quite a few uh, links for you. Here's there. It looks uh, rather very something on Wikipedia or so it, did, it really open many, uh, many pages. So just for you to have an idea of things that might be uh, a meaning of the word you want to use as a package name. So that's quite uh, useful. And it tells me that the name is valid because you know our packages can't have, for instance, uh, so that would be invalid, look, adding an iPhone in the name that will make it an invalid name for a package. But it's available on CRAN by a conductor and GitHub. I obviously don't really care today because I'm not going to publish this package for real, but that's not good to know. It looked uh, at these different uh, sources for knowing whether it's a bad word or associated with something uh, that's not what you want it to be associated with. So the package name is actually um, okay. So now I can really create a package. To create a package, I can use a use this function that's called create package. So I'm going to do that now. Create package and I want to create it uh, one folder up. So what I have here is a path to the um, to to the folder I wanted to uh, I want to create the package and I name the folder like the package. I going to do that and you see that. Okay, so what happens very fast is that choose this create a package and open the package to the project for you, but let's go back to my first window here. So what did use this um, do? So it created the folder, there's the packages, 
it uh, opens the R Studio, the corresponding R Studio project. It created an R folder, this metadata file that we're going to look at uh, there, this as well, this as well. And it added things to R building norm, getting norm. So many things that would be a bit uh, harder for me to do uh, myself because I would need to remember all these small steps. And there were no error messages or anything here. So things should be good um, in the mini package tool folder. So what do I have here? So um, I have a thing called the git ignore. So if you're familiar with using git for version control, this file is a list of folders and files that should not be um, taken into account for version control. And when I put uh, this, this um, package on GitHub, these are things that wouldn't be in the uh, GitHub repository. This would only be uh, on my computer. Then our building error. So this is um, something. So when R builds your package, you know, for other people to install it. So it creates um, like a folder of your package. It doesn't need to take everything from this source folder. So you could have a Markdown file here called my notes for packet development. If you put the file name here, then it's uh, all fine. It will only be uh, in this source folder and not in what your other people install. So that's our build ignore. And then, and you, so, and then there is one uh, uh, file called description and it contains all the metadata about your package. So it has its name, its title. So it's called title because uh, it's in title case. It should be short and it explains what your package does. So um, exemplify oops, package development. So that's the title of my package. Then it has my name. So how did it guess my name? So using the information from my R profile, Usbis was able to um, write my name and my RC ID directly uh, in this file. Then there is here a field called description. So it's quite confusing. So the description file, all uppercase as a field called description here that explains what the package does. So that will be a smaller uh, description that you could do. Then it tells uh, what the license here is. So that is the default license that I also indicated in my R profile that I'm coding. So this is very important for me and maybe for some of you as well. So my name is Mael with an accent. So if I don't put this here, then I'm going to get uh, problems. So very, very good to have this here. Uh, this we don't need to go uh, into today. This is um, related to how your package would uh, load data. And then this is um, related to how we're going to create the documentation from the pa for the package. So right now, uh, it's not that uh, important um, either, but it's fair and it was um, added by, by use this. Then we have the uh, .r approach file, which is for our studio to have the metadata of the project or options and these things. The so namespace here has a very important line. It says, do not edit by hand. So, well, do not edit by hand. We'll see also later uh, what it does, but like this is something where you, well, in particular, the functions that you want your users to have access to, so they will be listed here. And then we have an R folder, it's empty, but that's where our, our R code um, will live. Um, Mayel, yeah. uh, sorry to interrupt, but uh, Hedia has a question. She says, what's the difference between create package and create tidy package? Create tidy package, so, uh, so create tidy package is something that has uh, more standards. So that's, uh, so all the use this function with tidy in their name, that's something for the tidyverse team. So that's their, their best practice. So we could use that, but it, it, it probably has uh, a few more things than, than you create package. But uh, let's look at the documentation. Uh, so it says follow tidyverse conversion, which are generally a little stricter than the default. Hmm. So we would need to try. So maybe it add our studio as an author. I, I don't really know. So we could try and see what it does. Uh, that's, that's a bit vague here without, without trying. 
Does it answer the question? Okay. <laughs> um, so to develop a package, you don't really need to know version control, but this would uh, with this these two things. So knowing how to develop packages and knowing how to use Git, at least a bit of Git, go well together. And uh, so today I'm going to use Git for um, my demonstration. You don't really need those, but um, when I create a package, I after running create package, I run use this use Git. Um, so it uh, initialized the Git repository, and you see all this. Uh, so because this is actually a chatty package, so it tells you what it does. And I've once been told, so sometimes that could, you could think that's a lot of things, but someone once told me that um, it's a great thing because you see all the things that you didn't need to do yourself. So this uh, should make us happy to see all, all of these things. And it uh, asked me whether I, it's okay to come into the file. Yes, it is. And we can restart our studio now. And now uh, on the top uh, right part of the R Studio screen, we have our Git tab, where uh, we will see the changes and we will be able to commit changes. So we see here that the default branch is a master branch. I'm just going to change that real quick. Uh, to the main branch because uh, main doesn't have any doesn't remind doesn't remind anyone of slavery. Uh, so if okay, cool. So now that I have this very uh, small package, so just a shell of a of a package, I'm going to create uh, one function. So to create uh, one function, so there is a function in use this. It's not called create function, it's called use r. And what you put uh, as an argument to it is the name of the file that you want to create. And so it uh, created a file under r, the time that r file. And that's where I'm going to put the code for, for my first function in this package. And to do it, so. To create a function, I'm going to copy paste from what I had prepared here. So it's a function that indicates the time now. So I was actually very stressed to not be <laughs> in time at this meetup because of the time change that happened in the US and not here. So of course the function today is about what time um, it is. So this is um, my function. It uh, takes the current time. It formats it with only hours and minutes. And then uh, each regions are sentence with the, um, the time in it. So now how do I make this function available to me? So you know I could source or copy paste uh, these lines into my console. But once you start developing packages, there is actually uh, an easier way to do that. There is a dev tools load all function. So it's going to load all the code from your uh, package so that it's available to you. So that's the first time we run it today and that's something we will run a few times and once you are developing packages you are actually running uh, dev tools at all all the time. So it has loaded so now if I type what time it should be available to me and it tells me uh, the time it is now so you see what time it is here. Um, okay so we have a function it works it does what I expected uh, it does, but um, we need to document it so that users, when they install my package, you know that they are able to type something like what time with a question mark. So how do we do that? So we click inside the um, function that we have just uh, defined and we can go um, in the code menu and a bit better there is insert our oxygen skeleton. You see that there is also a keyboard shortcut that one could learn for inserting the R or R oxygen skeleton. I actually don't know many keyboard shortcuts, so I usually use the menu. So what does it do? 
So you see that uh, a few things were added here with comments uh, with, um, I don't know the name of this sign in English. So this sort of comment here, these are um, the Worksygen um, lines and Worksygen is a package that will transform this into the documentation format that R needs. And what do you enter here? So here you would enter the title of the function, I think. Um, no, I didn't write the documentation in case. So I can call it current time. And what does it return? So like a character string with the time and experts, this means that this is a function that I do not define only for myself, only for uh, the functions of my package, that's something that will be user facing. So when users install my package, they will get the what time function. And here uh, under this uh, example, so we, and these things with a, an app, these are what are called Roxygen tags. And there are many more than these ones, but we can start using just uh, these few tags that were inserted um, by our studio. So the example here will be super easy. That's the only thing that my, my function can do. So I have the source of the documentation inside my R function. But now uh, if we type what time question mark, so nothing uh, happened yet because we need to run another function called document. So that calls document. And so it did two things. It updated the namespace. So let's look here. So I here in my time.r file, I have the export tag to say that it's a function that I want my the users of the package to access. And it's now um, in the namespace with the export uh, function here. Then it tells me that it wrote uh, a .rd. So rd stands for R documentation. Now, if I type question mark, what time I actually get um, a documentation um, page for my function here. So we now have a function, it's documented. I said that it does what I expect it to do, but nothing uh, is preventing it from stopping what I wanted to do when I edit it. So I'm going to add a test of my uh, function behavior. So if you remember so a bit earlier, actually when we created the function here, so use this gave us two to-dos. So it told us modify our time.r and call your test to create a matching test file. So we are going to obey this um, to do and create a test file. And we're going to name it uh, with the same name as the R file. That makes it easier later. And so this uh, did many things. So because this is the first test that we add in our package, it also adds our test infrastructure. So what is a test infrastructure? So it added in description, it wrote that our package needs, so not for um, the users, but for development to test that package. And it needs the latest edition of the test that package. You are learning package development today, good for you, because test that third edition is the only, well, the first test that edition that you will know. So other people that might have learned about test that earlier, they add some code in their test code in their package that they needed to update if they wanted to use the new edition. You don't because that's the one you, you get to know. So that's that's quite good. And then it created a test folder. So that's um, a new one here. And under that test folder, there is a file called testbad.r that we don't need to edit. And that just has this uh, function about how to run tests, but we don't need to, um, to edit it. The test file folder is where the actual test live and that's where we were going to, to edit. So it created a, a test file with um, an example test that multiplication works, but we wanted to test what our package does. So, Kayla? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Kayla. Yeah. Uh, so, there's a question in the chat. Uh, can we make a package of R markdowns or of tutorials? 
So sorry, can you repeat the question, please? Uh, can we make a package of our markdown our markdowns or of tutorials? So you mean starting from an R markdown file and making a package out of it? I think that's what the question means. So um, so let me open uh, an untitled. <laughs> so just let me. Uh, so there is a package called Fusion that helps you uh, go from an R markdown file to a package. So if you started working in an R markdown file, so that's one thing. Then uh, you can share R markdown templates with, within an R package. So templates, not full R markdown. And for that, you would use, use this, use R, uh, R markdown template. So there is a function for that. So that's one thing. Then uh, if you mean share, like a string a tutorial, so I would check, for instance, the learner documentation because it explains you how you would share your learner to draw with a package. Uh, yeah. So these are the different things that come to mind um, about R Magdalene in, in packages. Awesome, thank you. And then I think Stephanie has a question as well. I, I was just trying to get someone to pay attention to the fact that the question was coming that you're trying to interrupt Mayel. Um, but Mayel, I'm wondering if now because you've gone through like creating a packages and now you've moved into you're now in the what you're doing now it might be a good time to stop and ask people questions because remember when you said something about moving quickly through this stuff yeah sorry <laughs> thank you i'm wondering um maybe others yeah. want to ask questions now are there other questions the one thing i definitely need to do now is, oops, to make a comment now. <laughs> um, in general, <laughs> you should use informatic uh, commit messages. Uh, this is not uh, an informative commit messages. I'm just going to uh, try and find how can I. I, I just read somewhere, but it's better to mute yourself if you're typing a secret thing uh, in a live demonstration. Um, okay. Okay. So, um, so I was creating the first uh, test file, but uh, that should. Um, Mile? Mile? Oh, yeah, sorry. Sorry. There's another. There's another question in the chat now. Um, the question is about how how to make a package just having data only. Oh uh, yeah, you could you could do that. So you would uh, just create a package with your create package function, and then you would choose the use data function in uh, use this. So that would be a way to um, share your data. And so that's uh, one part of the answer. The second part of the answer would be that there is an uh, a blog post about sharing data with your package. I don't know the um, URL by heart, but if you go to the full list of uh, our hub blog post, there is one with data in the title that explains how you would share data uh, in, a, in a package. But yeah, you could have a package that has no, no code in it, and there are packages out there with only data. Um, Amayel, I'm sorry to interrupt, but it seems like um, a few of the people are having audio issues. Not sure if it's from their end or your end, but mm -hmm. uh, one of the suggestions is, seems like Zoom has some filters, audio filters, and you could set it to medium or high so that your typing no, uh, sound goes down. That was well, the I'm suggestion to, to use the, I the actually chat. forgot to use my... Uh, yeah, sorry about that. I, I don't know. Few people seem to no, be no, having audio issues. Read. So thank you. Can you can you still hear me? No, maybe not. Um, yes, we can. Okay, I I don't hear anything so far. Mm.
Uh, no, we can't hear you, Maya. And now, we yeah, okay. <laughs> and I'm going to type. Can you still hear me typing very loudly or is it I'm better? Sorry. Oh, cool. Yeah, sorry, everyone. I should have uh, done that earlier. Thank you. So we're getting the test. So because later I might uh, edit the function. So it's a very easy function for like a very simple, yeah, not perfect. easy. Sorry. We we can't see your screen right now. Oh yeah. <laughs> so no, you can. <laughs> yep, there we go. So the function here is very simple, but later I might change it. I might change other part of my package, and this function might stop working. And maybe every time I make a change, I will try and run the function in my console to see whether it still works. But that's not um, very efficient. So instead, I'm going to write a test and all tests uh, in test that they start with expect. So I'm going to uh, write the first one um, here. So sorry, I'm going to type. This. Okay, so expect. I, I want to use a function called expect type to check that the type of the um, of the return uh, of what the function return is still the same. And I just wanted to show in the documentation. So it says that expect type checks, checks the type of X and using this function type of is how you would uh, know what the type of the object is. So, so oops. So uh, when we have a character, so the type of this thing is a character. So my first test is that I want the output of what time, oops, sorry, here to be a character. So that's the test. Uh, and to run the test, I can use the run test button here. And it does this in, the, in this part in the build tab. And it tells me that there is uh, one test that passed. It's done, the test is complete, there is no problem. So what happens if it doesn't pass? Um, so imagine that here, instead of doing that, for some reason at the end of my function, I put a written one. And uh, so I changed uh, what it does. I'm going to run the test again. And here I see that there is a failure and it tells me that the what time output as type double, not character. So that's a, a very simple example, but this is a kind of safeguards that the, the test means. So uh, realizing that you change something that, that is now uh, broken. And there are uh, many other expectation in the test that package, all starting with expect. So to write, um, Further tests. What 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 one would do is looking at them and see uh, whether one of them makes sense for our function. And what will also help is reading as uh, a test of our packages to know what uh, what one to to use. Now something that came with testbat third edition and that is quite cool is the notion of snapshots. And because our function returns text, so that might uh, make sense to look at the snapshot. So what is a snapshot? So I'm going to add another line in the in this big text with expect. So it is expect snapshot, sorry. No. I'm trying to remember the name of the function. So up. 
sorry, so that's okay, expect snapshot. Okay, so I'm going to type expect snapshot for a time. So what is it uh, going to sorry? I need to fix a function before I do that. Okay, so I fix a function. I added a test, that's a snapshot. So let's run the test. And it tells me that it adds a new snapshot. So a snapshot is in the test path folder. So our test is here, our test file under te test test path. There is now a folder called snaps and it has a markdown file called time.md with uh, the code and the output of our, of our function. So tests are most interesting when they start failing. So I'm going to make it fail. So just so we see that, that what, what it does. So imagine that I change this and I'm going to add um, a typo in the sentence that my function returns. I'm going to run the test again. So this one is not going to fail because it still returned a character. So um, it tells me that one test fail, the snapshot of code has changed. So it tells me that there a snapshot used to be, it is blah, blah. Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, I shouldn't do that with a function that returns the time. Oh, that was stupid. Hmm. That was a very bad I I idea. So it's going to, of course, it's going to change because every time you change, you run the function again, the time has changed. That was not a, a good use case. But we would also see that the word here has changed and we might want to, to fix that. So don't use a snapshot when you're using the current time um, in, your, in your function. So I'm going to delete this folder and delete this function, this test. Um, okay. And another way for us to, to run tests, or we can run tests uh, from the button here, or we could do that from here. So in the build tab, there is um, test package. So the difference is that if you have several test files, it, will, it would run all of them. And from that same build tab, so I'm realizing I, there was something I wanted to do before, but before adding a test. So there is also this button check. So for checking that our package complies with the rules of packages. So I'm going to run it now and see if there is anything amiss with my package. So that's a check. So in particular, it runs a test, but it also uh, check other things. So I get a warning that tells me I have an invalid license file pointer. So what does that mean? In my description file, it's written that my license is MIT and a file called license. In my package folder, I do not have a file called license. So I need to add one or to remove the warning. To add a license to your package, you can use any of the use this uh, use license function. So there, and in, in this case, the one called MIT for using the MIT license. And I'm going to add my name uh, as a copyright holder. So it, it added two files. So one of them is for us over is that your uh, GitHub will be able to, if we do that later to see that there is a, a license in, in, your, in your repository. Now, if I run check again, it should uh, have no warning. Okay, good. So it's all green. And this uh, run, uh, runs our test. So at this point, we have a package with one function. This function has one test, and we see that the package passes uh, our command check. Now we're going to make our function a bit um, 
more complicated by adding a parameter to it. So for now, it has no parameter. So uh, I'm looking at my snippet. So I copy the code for the old function and I'm going to pass it here. So my function has changed. There is no an agreement called language. I check that the language is in the two possibilities, either French or English. And then I, you, I define the time as I did before. And depending on the language, I return a sentence in either French or English. So to uh, see how this function work, I'm going to load uh, my package with the dev tools load all function. And I'm going to write uh, run road time. So the default language is not French. So it returns a sentence in French. Now, if I add language is equal to English, I get a, a sentence uh, in, in English. So there is a parameter. Our problem that we have now is that it's not documented. So if I type what time, my documentation is outdated because it doesn't mention the existence of any parameters. So I'm going to add this parameter to the um, documentation. So I'm going to add a new our oxygen tag. So the param one with a parameter name, language, and it's language either of R for French or EN for English. So this is a um, explanation of the parameter. Now for this to go from here to uh, the documentation that users would see, I have to run the document function. It updated the what time um, documentation. So if I tap what time, so I could type what time again, or so that's hidden here. You can refresh the help topic from the help topic itself. And now the uh, documentation mentions uh, the parameter. Um, and so this, is, this uh, error message doesn't necessarily follow the best error message standards, but if there is an error message and it should help the users. Uh, if I like this error message and I don't want it to uh, be changed by any of my further changes of the package, I need to add a test for it. And the best way nowadays to test for uh, an error message is the snapshot error function. And this time, because the error doesn't contain the time, that shouldn't be a bad idea. So if anyone type uh, what, what time with a language that's not one of the two language in my package. So Spanish, they should get an error. So I'm going to do that in the console first, just so you um, so you see here. So if I type, oops, sorry. OK, I'm going to do that now here. So if I type uh, what time language equal to ES here, I get an error that says I ever choose FREN as a language. In my um, test file, I'm going to uh, make a, a snapshot of this error message. So the test will pass. Uh, why is there a warning? Hmm. Okay, because it... I don't see the warning. I could explore that later. But there is now this um, uh, this new snap snapshot. If I change the error message now, so I could add a typo, add an O. I'm going to run the test again from here. So it's going to tell me that the snapshot changed, that the old message was choose, now it has 3.0. So I could either fix my code and rerun the test, or I could say, oh, no, this is a change I wanted to do. And I could run the snapshot accept function and say that this is a new um, standard error message for my package. This is how we would uh, test for errors. Um, so one last thing to change in the code of the package before it's just, um, well, not just, but before it's infrastructure is that our code for now doesn't use um, any uh, other uh, package, which so is just um, what's already available. 
I would like to show how your package could depend on another package. So I'm going to add a dependency on the praise package. So for that, I need to modify the function and uh, using what I already um, typed before. So I replace all the code with new code. So what is the difference now is uh, the difference here, um, or I, so there, there are two differences. So I'm going to depend on the Arlong package. So this is um, a possibility for checking that the argument that the user enters correspond to one of the two possibilities that you have in the code. And I also add an exclamation using the praise package. So what does this function do now? So I'm going to load all the So two things that my package do, does differently now. So if there is an error and I typed um, Spanish, so now uh, language must be, as a uh, error message is language must be one of FR or English. Um, and it even gives me a useful int in case ES was a typo for EN. And if there is no, uh, if there's if I use an, a language that exists, so the EN language. So now it first has a random exclamation before the time. So I have the two packages here, but for the package to work, I need the users to have the packages installed. So um, these packages need to be registered in the description file. So to do that, I need to run a function in useVis called usePackage. So I need to use the Arlang package and the same thing for the praise package. And so this um, added the two packages to description. Now we have changed the error message. So if I run the test again, let's see what happens. So it tells me that the snapshot of the error has changed. And that's actually something I wanted to do. I wanted to have a new better error message. I'm going to run snapshot accept time. And now it has updated the snapshot of my error. So we have a better function. It uses other packages and we have listed those in, in description. I'm just going to make a comment here. So are there any questions? I don't so, see any raised hands, so I think we can continue. Okay, so we have a package with a function that uses two other packages, our packages test, only test passes, but no one uh, knows uh, what it does. Uh, just to note that this uh, demonstration won't be much longer and there will be a five minute break after, after this. I forgot to say that there would be a break, so sorry. Um, yeah, so if we want people to know what our package does and to use it, there are two things. We first need to write a presentation of it that makes it look cool. And then we need to put it online. So I'm first going to write a um, public facing uh, uh, explanation of the package. So that's a readme. And I'm going to use a readme RMD function. So when you write a readme for your package, you can either use Markdown directly or R Markdown. So R Markdown might be uh, better because you can write a demonstration of what your package does. So what does use this uh, use uh, readme uh, do? So it creates a readme. It uh, won't be in the uh, installed package. And it tells you that you need to modify it. Uh, and this I will explain in a minute what it does with this uh, hook. So there is a skeleton of, um, of, the, of the package uh, readme here. And there is a sentence for me to fill. So this is very useful. So uh, it's to tell you what time it is. 
So here it's uh, an example, a simple one in general, but that is one of the most crucial thing for you to do when you write a package is to make it um, uh, like look useful for other people and 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 not only you look, look sorry look useful for your target audience. So, so anyone reading the readme should be able to see whether it's a package that fits uh, their needs from just skimming swimming the readme. So it's very important to to write a concise and, and a good description here. So this is not the case. We cannot install it from uh, Cran. So I'm just going to write to do. And we could add the, um, uh, once we have a GitHub repository, here would be the place to write um, installation instructions from, from GitHub. And there is a space for so the template encourages you to write an example. So basic example code. So very good. I can write what time here. And this is my, my readme. And other stuff here that I'm going to, to delete. So I have my readme. And Imagine I forget to knit in me and I'm going to commit it. Uh, I write add in me, I have the RMD, I click on commit and it tells me that readme.md is out of date. So this is very useful. So in that case, it's not only out of date, it just doesn't exist. But have so this all depends on what on what use this added. So the um, commit hook. So thanks to this commit hook, you will never forget to need your uh, readme before you commit it. So that's a useful reminder that's built in um, in uses. Oh, and another interesting thing here. So here we tried loading my packages with the library and there is no package so called mini package too because I only loaded it all the time with the load all function. I forgot to install my own package. So how would you, I install my own package? In the build tab, so there is a, um, we saw that we could run test, but we could check the package, but we can also install the package from the button that's here. So now I have installed my own package. This means that if I go back to my initial um, R console, which is not the one where I develop the package. I can now do library mini package two, type what time, and it works. So I could not use any function, well, not any function, the only function in my package from anywhere on my computer. And so now I can need the readme. Good, so I have the readme and it executed the code here. So we see the example. And now I can add the readme. Okay. So the package only exists on my computer. I'm going to put it on my now on GitHub. Again, I'm going to use and use this function. So this one is called use GitHub. And here you could choose to make it private or public. I'm just going to make it uh, public. Hmm. Oh, there are uncommitted changes, right? So I need to commit this thing here. And good. So no, I don't want to proceed. I'm going to run this function again. Uh, is it okay to commit it? So why is my description file changed at this point? So let's see. So what was added? So USBs created a GitHub repository for my package and it added the URL to this repository to my description file. So this is super useful because it's easy to forget, but it's very useful for your users to be able to find the source of the package from its metadata. So that's great. And yes, it's okay to commit it. So now you could find my package online at my GitHub account. And the reason why Usebis was able to do that, so they're you know, creating a uh, repository under my own account is because of the setup, the painful setup in the Usebis setup article. So part of it uh, consists in linking the GitHub account to my uh, local computer. 
and it has everything I have here. And you see that the description of the repository here exemplifies package development. That comes from here, the, the title in my description file. So I use this to um, have a, an informative uh, repository description on GitHub. And if you wanted to install it, or any user, so they could now do that from uh, GitHub. So uh, in my readme, I can write that you could, and notice that I either use R directly for this chunk, or I could do R, but it shouldn't be um, uh, evaluated when I need the readme. I don't want to install the package every time I need the readme. So first, users will need to install the remote package, and then they can do remotes, install GitHub, mail and the name of the package. So I have added the installation instruction, knit the readme, well, and I can commit this. Oops. Okay, and now on the GitHub page, I'm going to refresh. And um, I see that there is an installation um, instruction here. So one, um, and we see that there is an interface here for users so they can, uh, oh, there is even a talk now, a table of content. Oh, that's cool, I didn't know that. So now you can have a table of content from the top of your readme. Not very useful for a short one, but that could be cool for a longer one. So once we are here at this stage, we have our minimal package with one function that uses two packages. We have a test for its behavior when everything goes well and a test for this, its behavior when there is uh, a wrong input um, uh, from the user and it's, uh, it's online. Uh, what else could we do at, at this point? Um, so we saw that we could run the check uh, here. From here, we can run the check button every time we make a change. So to see if we broke anything. So the problem with that approach is that you need to remember to run check all the time. So another way to do that would be for us to ensure that every time we make a change and it arrives on GitHub, then uh, checks are run on the cloud. Uh, so on GitHub, not are run on our computer. So how uh, would we ensure that? So we have a new this function again. So there are different uh, services allowing you to run check on your package every time there is a change. So the most popular one at the moment is called GitHub Actions and it um, happens all on GitHub. It's also very well integrated into useless. So we can start running it by using use GitHub Action and the one that's called standard. So there are different flavor here. So what does it do? So it adds a badge here and we will see uh, what the badge is once it's on uh, GitHub. So I, I, I have to need the readme because it edited the .rmd file. And it added here uh, things under the .github folder. So what it has here, adds here, sorry, is a recipe for your package to be checked on, um, on a server that belongs to GitHub. And not only that, but also uh, checked on different operating systems. So I'm going to add this GitHub Actions infrastructure and push the change to GitHub. So what changed here in our uh, repository? So there is a tab called Actions here. And that is where our package here is going to be checked on all these operating systems. It's going to take a while the first time we do that because it has to install all the packages. The next time they will be cached. Well, there aren't many packages for this one, but still. So with this single comment in our console here, so this was, no, that's not here, sorry. So the use GitHub action check standard. So we did that, we added the file to Git and pushed them to GitHub. 
So with this, then every time I'm going to make a change to my package, it will be checked. And if it has any failure, I'm going to get a, a notification. So that could be, uh, so that could be useful and is uh, often useful. Um, so one of the last things I wanted to show. So we have our package and you could still tell your friends and your colleagues, hey, you can go look at my package, it's on GitHub, you can read the readme and see what it does. And uh, this small badge here will change colors depending on the checks. Now the problem is it's very overwhelming for people to look at a GitHub repository because it has a lot of mess, like maybe it's actually overwhelming for you now, like to have all the code here, all these different tabs, that's not really uh, meant for people to discover and use a new tool. So for creating, so we need to create a website for our package. So how would we create a, a website for a package? Well, we would we'll first need to install the package done website, uh, uh, not website, sorry, package. Once we've done that, we will use another, use this function, use package done. And uh, it doesn't do a lot of things. It just add uh, infrastructure for package on an empty configuration file for package on in particular. Now we can build a website. So it's just, uh, it's one function only, build site from package on. And so it created a website here, so in so in my folder of my package, I have many files now, but I have a folder called docs, and in this docs folder, there is a whole website, and it opened the preview services. So this is familiar for you, like from other uh, package documentation website, probably. So it has, and it has a nicer interface for your users to uh, to find to find out what your what your package does. It's less uh, messy than looking at a GitHub repository. Now our um, website is only on our computer. So ideally we want, we want our website for our package to be online and we want it to always be up to date. Like we don't want to remember to update our package, our package website. So to just like we can run checks on GitHub, we can also have like uh, another computer that ours uh, build our package on website. And it's in a in a function called use GitHub action. Sorry, and um, package down. So I'm going to run this function. So it adds another recipe to our uh, package source called uh, package on.yaml, and it's a recipe for GitHub to build our website every time we make a change. So I'm So it will take a while uh, until uh, the website is ready. So it it was fast on our computer to build the website. The reason for that is because we had everything installed on GitHub. So if I go back to the GitHub repository and the actions tab, so there is a package done recipe being uh, um, applied. Kyle? So for yeah. sorry. Sorry to interrupt, there's a oh, question no. in the chat. Uh, what was the function again for building the website? Oh yeah, that's build site from package done. Um, sorry, here. And it's also in the notes from the demonstration. Perfect, thank you. Um, yeah, so the problem is now, <laughs> we're good. this was the last thing, so we're going to wait for the um, uh, the GitHub action uh, workflows to be to be finished. So when they're finished, two things will happen. So when the checks are run, the badge here will be either green if everything went well or red if there was an issue. So that's one thing. And once the package done one is finished, we will be able to uh, add a new URL to our, our website because it will, it will be online. Are there any um, questions at, at this point? No, I'm just going to check on this. 
Ha, ah, is it finished? Yeah, cool. So we can go to the, so our, so to have our, our website, our package on website. So we add to run the use this use package done function. And then we added a recipe for GitHub actions to build our package on website. It's not built, so where it is? Where is it, sorry? Um, it's in a branch of our repository. So our whole website is in the GitHub pages branch of a repository. So that's good to know. So how do we make it available? So from settings in the repository, we scroll down and when the uh, 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 thing about GitHub pages, it's disabled, we're going to enable it. And we say that the source of the website is the GitHub pages branch here. We save that, oops. So that was under GitHub pages and it says that our site is ready to publish. Let's open that. So in my experience, it takes a while for it to pick it up. But if we add index.html after that, so that's not delete later once the systems have picked it up, but right now we need that. So we see that our website is here. So we have an address for our documentation website, and we're going to add it in two places for people to be able to find it. So in code here, we need to add it here. So as website. So that was on the uh, repository description. That's one place. Oh, sorry, it's three uh, locations. So one, GitHub repository description. Two, URLs in description here. We want it uh, to be here for users to find it. And lastly, we need to add it to the package and configuration as URL here. So we build the website and then we add the URL to it in, in three um, places. So this was the last uh, things I wanted to show about package tunnel. Or just a note, so our website is a standard website, so the vanilla website you get with package done. What then makes sense is looking at the um, documentation of package done to find how you can configure your website for it to be more uh, informative to, to users. So that's all from the demonstration. Are there questions? Barry, you had a question? Would you like to ask? So there's a question, question saying, use GitHub pushes the materials to GitHub as a package, as opposed to the previous pushes, which were basically updating a repo of files. So actually, yeah, so there is use Git and use GitHub. Is that the question? So use Git uh, is for initializing Git locally and use GitHub is for creating the GitHub repository. And it only does the push the first times. So after that, you need to use the like either the RStudio Git tab or the command line to push to GitHub. Okay, I think that answers the question. And there's one more. Um, how does the package version change or how do they post version changes to the package? Hmm. Ah, cool. Uh, <laughs> so uh, you can use the use this package again if you want, if you, if you want to do that. So, so I'm just going to commit the two changes uh, to have a clean uh, git state here. So if you want to update your package, you can use a functional. Uh, so first to say you want to release to CRAN, you're going to use a function called use release issue. Um, and it, um, it asks you like here, so what do you want to, like how much do you want to change your package? Is it a ma ma major, major minor uh, patch um, release of your package? So same, say it's a patch, like we only change the number at the end. So it, and what it does is it's create a checklist for us of things to do before we release it to CRAN. And even if we don't want to release it to CRAN, uh, to change the version, we would use the uh, use this use version function. So that would change the version number in the description file for us. And once we've done that and would put the package on CRAN or on Bioconductor or, or whatever, we would go back to using a version number with a 999 at the end. 
for indicating is a dir version. And for that, we will use the use this use dir version function. So that's how we could change the version number. Now, how to decide how, how much to change it. So either major, minor, or patch, that's up to you, depending on whether you think you've made a big change or a very small one. And there are, so that's one thing. And, and there are people who like to change the version number every time they make a small change. So right now, uh, this is a number. I could put a, a two here if I make a small change because I, I want the version number to be to be different. That's up to you and how you want to change the version number. If you do, and how you, it's also depends on how your users would um, uh, use that, like how often they would update your package from GitHub. Actually, uh, my question is, uh, th thanks for asking. This is something new I learned today. But uh, I have uh, created a package using the player older version of it. And when I'm trying to re reload it today, it was saying that it is done in the old, old version of it and you have to renew that package again. Ah, oh, well, it, it really depends on, on the package in question. So, like, I, I don't know whether maybe your package code needs to be updated with the most recent R changes. Or maybe it depend. It's uh, because of the dependency of the package. I couldn't give a good uh, general answer on this. No. You have to rerun that, or uh, changing the document file would be good enough. But you could try. Like you can try ch uh, changing that and seeing if it works. Okay. But but later I will show where to ask for package development help, and that might uh, help because I don't think I can give a good answer now to this question. Nice. Thank you. Um, so uh, in our demonstration, so uh, uh, so things that were important is that every time we made a change to the code for being able to access the code in the console, uh, I use the dev tools load all function. Then if I wanted my package to be available elsewhere or to need my readme, I needed to install it. And there is a button for installing my package in the R Studio uh, build tab. For everything I showed, there is a use this function. So uh, from the simplest thing, like creating an R file, there is a use this function for that, for creating a test file, or for creating a recipe that uh, updates a documentation website of my package every time I make a change. So for all, the, all of these things, there was a use this function, which is why when you start developing packages, it might be useful to have a look at the whole list of use this functions, just so you know that they exist and that there is a helper for this particular thing. Uh, we, uh, I, I mentioned that we can run checks and it's important to run the check regularly. So you might notice something has gone wrong in your package, especially because this will run the test of the package. Um, and so these things are hard because they're new. So you need to remember they exist to uh, develop some sort of automatism. So this is hard, but what's really hard and harder than the automatic stuff is writing good code, writing a good interface and writing good documentation. So that's uh, something that's less uh, easy to automate. Now that doesn't mean uh, it's impossible. And in the slide deck after the break, I, I want to show a few tips on how um, we can learn how to to improve our skills in in these different um, aspects of a of a package. And you could do more with packages than having a single function that tells you what time it is in two languages. So you could add an R markdown template to your package. So that can be useful, uh, for instance, as an internal package at work. You could distribute data using the use data function. You could package an old Shiny app in a package. So for that, you could uh, look at other packages that do that and look at the framework called Golemverse. That's an old framework for packaging Shiny apps. And you could also, for instance, uh, like make a package that is actually uh, the source of your scientific paper, so which is called a research compendium. You could also do less with packages. So I mean, two things by that. First, if you have an idea for a great package, first check that no one else has done that. You could still want to create your own because you have a different opinion or the package that exists is too old, but it's still useful to see if there is any duplicate effort out there. Now, 
uh, on the previous slide, as I said, you could package uh, analysis in our packages. There are people that are against this idea. So if you want to do that, also read the contrary point of view. So this is a blog post by Miles McBain, project as an R package and okay idea. So that um, would be useful. Do you have any question at this point? In that case, we can start the short. Um, sorry, there are oh. questions. I wasn't oh, sure. no. <laughs> I don't um, have doc open. So if there's any questions in there, you'll have to ask. But from the chat, um, any insights on working with pull requests for package improvements from collaborators or community? Um, so that would be a long question to answer, but I like <laughs> first, that, that's very useful to use um, pull requests. And there are helpers in the use this package for these things as well. And there is the whole USVs article in the USVs website about pull requests helpers. So that would be uh, a tip to look into this. And then regarding the workflow of using pull requests for collaborating, it makes sense to read the documentation of GitHub to see what, what's out there. And then to talk with the, your collaborators on how they would prefer you to deliver the, the feedback in the pull request. So there are many ways you could use the pull request. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Um, another question is a question about assertive coding or writing error messages. To which extent do you check the objects you create in your function? Do you just check your input and output objects or also intermediate objects that aren't returned to the user but used internally? And do you have any recommendations for assertive coding packages? Um, so I've once read that it's if you I think I read that in the R packages book, which uh, is like the uh, best reference out there. Like something that if you test your internals too much, then you cannot change it. No, you can change them, but it's harder to change the internals. So, and that's a balance to be found. Like maybe if you check the interface of your function and not too much internals, then it's easier for you to change the way you do things inside your package. So that would be one aspect to take into account. But no other things come to mind now. I would recommend reading the test chapter of the R packages book for better tips than what I am providing now. Um, OK, and one last question. If I want to include a database in my package and example files, where should they be? Mm, so a database or I would <laughs> recommend reading the R hub blog post about data. But I wrote, but I don't remember <laughs> the answer to this question. So I hope the answer to this question is in that blog post. Okay, thank you. Mail, it's Steph. I put the link to the R Hub blog post. It's oh, in thank you. the shared doc. It's called How to Distribute Data with Your R Package. If that's Fantastic. what you were referring thank to. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so let's refresh this. <laughs> Otherwise, we don't get a five minute break. Okay, so now this is a five minute break.
Okay, so I'm certain because this break came uh, after a very long demonstration, I should have had a, an earlier break. The next sections are actually much shorter than this one and uh, with our two demonstrations, so hopefully less messy than the first one. Why don't I see this one? Oops. No, like this, yeah. Um, so I wanted to give you a few tips on how, like, once you, you've written your first R package, like, how do you improve your R package or, and how do you improve your R package development skills? So what are the tools and tips that one can use for that? And it, the idea here is that I hope that each of you will learn at least one useful thing, like one new thing from, from this uh, slide deck. And maybe things that are not useful now, but that could be useful uh, later. So first, to improve your package bar workflow automation tools for having to remember less. And there are some tools that help you assess your package. So in the demonstration, we used our command check from the button in our studio. We could have run the dev tools check function in the console directly. And if you, you want to submit your package to buy a conductor, there is like an old process there, but there is a package called Bioc check for checking your package. So that's one. Uh, so these are tools that give you flags if something is wrong with your package. Then there are even more functions for getting this sort of automatic um, input. So there is a good practice package that will um, tell you things such as uh, that some uh, code lines are too long or some functions are too complicated. The linter package uh, can assess the style of your, of your code. And I heard that you can run it on the cloud using the code factor web service. Then we wrote test for a, our package. We had one function, we wrote two tests well, in case of errors in, uh, and in case everything was well. Um, when you have a bigger package, it's easier to miss part of your code and not test them. And you probably want to test most of your code. So for knowing where you missed something, you can use a cover uh, package. And the cover package tells you how many, how much of your code is covered, safeguarded by tests. And it could also tell you how much of your code as examples in the documentation. Then uh, you can also look for typos automatically in your documentation using the DevTools spell check function. So all of these functions gives you different flags about your, your package. And once they tell you something is wrong, you should improve your package. So do we need to improve the metrics by hand? So the answer is in partly yes and sadly partly no, we have to work um, to. So how can we improve our package? So regarding style code, we can, there is a style or package. So if you're interested in improving the style of your code automatically, you should look into the style or package. Then I maybe I cheated a bit, but I, I've put the Rock Student 2 package as an uh, automatic tool. So that's what we use from going from the tags we add in our R script to documentation for the user. And it also generated the namespace for us for exporting our function. So it actually did work that we then didn't have to do. The package done website is also something that uh, means less work. With one single function, package done build site, we get the whole website. We were even able to get this uh, website built for us by GitHub Actions after running one single use this function. Now, this was the default website. If you read package and documentation, it's possible to uh, tweak things such as the navbar, the reference index. So we had one function. Many packages have more than one function. By default, they are ordered automatically. And this alphabetical order is rarely the one that makes the most sense for your users. So you can actually group function uh, depending on what they do. And this makes the life of um, users uh, much better. So, uh, which means that you have to do a bit of manual work, but afterward, package that builds your, your website. And use this, of course, help us um, have a smoother work, workflow by helping us create all these 
simple scripts or this uh, fancy recipe for GitHub Actions. And now when and where do you use the tools that are out there? So <laughs> maybe just not know what I'm <laughs> explaining them, but how do you remember that they exist and how do you remember to, to use them, which is another problem. So we used continuous integration. So that was the idea that every time we change something in our package, something is run. And I'm using here a quote of Julia Silgi. She wrote in an excellent introduction to Travis continuous integration. Travis is a service that's no longer um, recommended, but the explanation of continuous integration in this blog post is still excellent and um, valid today. So she wrote, the idea behind continuous integration is that CI, so continuous integration, will automatically run our command check along with your test, etc. every time you push a commit to GitHub. You don't have to remember to do this. CI automatically checks the code after every commit. So that's the idea not to have to remember because now every time you make a change, uh, this will be done. Of course, this um, uh, demands that you uh, get familiar with uh, um, version control first, but this will be a worthwhile um, effort. And how do you learn continuous integration? So I would recommend Julia Sergi's post. It's about Travis, which is no longer recommended, but that, as I said, it's still valid. There is a talk by Jim Hester about GitHub Actions. And in use this, there are helpers. So in the demonstration, I used two um, use this function for adding the recipes. So they, they are very useful for um, using continuous integration without having to know too much uh, about the details. Now, if you have something a bit different in your package, maybe you depend on some sort of uh, library that's not uh, easy to install, how would you go about that? So another quote of Julia Sergis can help us. So she wrote on Twitter, life hack. My go-to strategy for getting Travis builds to work is snooping on other people's Travis.yaml files. Shoot out today to the tidier the Travis.yaml for solving my problem. And again, this is Travis, but this is still very valid for um, other continuous integration providers. So just look at other, not just because there's something to, to learn, that's not just, but look at other uh, people uh, configuration files. Um, and you could do more with continuous integration. So what we've done in the demonstration was every time we made a change, uh, the archive and check was run and the package done site was built, but maybe you could make this happen every Monday. You're just checking that your package builds again, or every time you apply a label to a pull request. So really you could do anything uh, with continuous integration. Another tool that you might want to use is pre-commit. You are actually already familiar with pre-commit because in the demonstration, I created the readme.rmd file and then I forgot to knit it. And I tried to commit the readme.rmd and there was a message telling me I wasn't allowed to do that because um, I hadn't needed the, the readme. And pre-commit uh, is this idea. So it's uh, a framework where you don't have to remember to do things well, or it's even different from using continuous integration to notice wrong stuff. It's using pre-commit hooks to not even commit wrong stuff to your repository. In R, you could check out the, um, I think it's the experimental. I'd have to check the pre-commit R package that makes this framework available for R users. And also when you use pre-commit, you can still skip the checks. Like if you want to do a commit and you don't want the checks to be run, you can do that. And another way to remember to check that your package here works is checking things before you release it to CRAN, for instance, and there are there is a checklist by CRAN, and there is a use this use release issue if that creates a check checklist for you. Or another approach would be using the DevTools release function that asks you questions directly in the console. So there are ways to not forget about things. Of course, you could spend a lot of time improving your package even workflow instead of improving the package itself. So that's a balance to be, to be found. But as a beginner, the good thing is that you can create good habits uh, right away. Then another way to improve your package is less automatic. It's reading code and reading about code. So why would you read source code? Um, so the first reason would be that you want to know what happens in a, in a function and the source code of a function is even better than its documentation for knowing exactly what's going on. Maybe you want to adapt code for your own needs. Maybe you're just curious 
or maybe invest a, a bit different, but say you want to use a praise package, you have no idea how to, you could read the documentation, but you could also look at how other, other people are using their package. So to read source code, you could use the lookup package, there is a package for helping you read source code, uh, look at the documentation of the GitHub search, because that gives you access to all the code on GitHub. And in particular, on GitHub, there are mirrors of the R source and of all current packages. And um, I found the podcast very useful for learning how to read code. It's a podcast episode, not about R, but still relevant by Patricia As, learning a new code base. And uh, what I really like is that it's very overwhelming to, to say, get familiar with the ggplot2 code base, for instance. But she has these steps that you can do. And the first step is clone the repository, try to build it. And that uh, makes things less overwhelming, in my opinion. Then you should read blog posts. <laughs> and I'm saying that because I write blog posts, but uh, I hope that's not uh, only uh, um, because of that. I think uh, blog posts are useful. So for um, package development, the R blog, the schools are open side blog, as well as uh, posts relevant to package development. So Tidyverse blog and our, on our weekly, you could find some posts related to uh, package development and you could blog, blog about your own uh, experiences. And you could um, also read uh, for us, so places where to ask for help from um, other, um, other people and you could help uh, other people as well. So there is an old fashioned mailing list, our package people. And there are two firms that I would recommend for uh, and that are more modern, so not email, uh, mailing list. So the R Studio community firm and our open type firm on both these spaces, you can ask and answer um, questions about package development. And in all cases, I would recommend managing your subscription and involvement wisely. In my case, all, all these things come to an inbox of my, uh, a folder of my inbox, and I only open it if I have time to engage with their questions. At our OpenSci, we run a software peer review system. So we use automatic tools, but not only. So we are, uh, have a system that's transparent, constructive, non-adversarial, and that's open. So you can read the review process for any package that has been reviewed. And these are for packages that are in our scope that's defined um, at this link. And it's interesting for, we hope, uh, Everyone, the authors whose package gets better, and the reviewers, as those volunteer reviewers, they also uh, get to learn something. And um, the idea is also that everyone gets involved in this uh, collaborate, like everyone involved in this collaborative system gets this um, uh, feeling of, uh, well, having collaborated in a in a good atmosphere. We have an online book of best practice that can be relevant for packet development in general as well. I've put the, the link here. And uh, there is even more, uh, there will be even more uh, review um, under our OpenSci umbrella. So uh, there is a project for uh, developing a system for statistical software peer review that you can read about and hear about as well, because there was a webinar about it recently. There are overvenues for having your package reviewed. And the idea in all these cases is that having users, having other people look at your codes, so not only automatic tools, can really help you get the perspective of someone else that is not you <laughs> about how well your package for instance, fits into the workflow of users. Um, yeah, do you have any questions? Maybe you, we won't have time for the next section, but that's not a problem. <laughs> First of all, this is amazing. Thank you so much, Mayal. We've covered a whole lot of ground in these past one and a half hours, starting with having no package, no function to having a package, however small, installing it on GitHub, having a web page, someone else being able to install it. This is amazing. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, and yes, do we have any more questions? Please put up your hand, put, throw it in chat or in the Google Doc. Because otherwise, I, mean, I have another slide. <laughs> but if we have any question, I don't need to render it. So we already have one new question in the chat. Um, at which stage would you submit your code for peer review to our open side before publishing a paper about it, submitting to CRAN? Or is it integrated in the publication process to journals? I guess that only um, applies if you're an academic. So these questions are so part of, uh, they are answered in the uh, 
definitely I'm not saying that not to answer the question, but just if I miss the details, uh, that's, that's something that's covered uh, in our, our guide. So the idea, so you shouldn't submit if you can choose your package to CRAN before you, you submit it to peer review, because if you submit it to CRAN, people are going to start using it. But if you submit it to peer review, maybe there will be major changes following reviews. And so you would be in the situation where you need to uh, submit breaking changes for to CRAN which is uh, not cool for the user. So ideally, you would submit it to peer review first. And regarding publication, so that's the same idea. If you write a paper about your package and then it uh, underwent major changes due to review, your paper is out of date. That's not uh, very good either. Um, OK. so. Does it make sense that for the eight minutes I go to the last slide deck? Janani, do you think? Yeah, that's a short uh, one. So, um, yeah, so uh, once you learn how to develop an R package, you could just, uh, not just is the bad word, like you could choose to develop it for your work and no one else, or you could want to get involved in the world of open source development. So why would you contribute to open source? So there are plenty of reasons why you want to do that. Maybe you just enjoy it. You want to give back. You want to develop your skills. You want to have something to add to your resume. So these are all valid reasons why to do to contribute to open source. And our package development is not the only way to contribute to open source. But because this is a meetup but about our package development, I'm going to focus just on this on this short slide deck. So it's very important if you get involved in open source and this is not your job, but you find a happy place, especially like if it happens in your free time, then it's important to find the right amount of time, the right task fit, so that you don't get uh, a burnout from uh, um, your open source activities. So you could publish your own packages. Like that's great because they are your own package, like you can choose your rules. It has your name on it, but then uh, it's more work for you. I gave this tutorial for our ladies um, a Bergen. And at that time, I look at pictures I had taken in Oslo in Norway. And I really like this picture of a statue where a man is fighting babies, because I think that's how maybe you could uh, feel if you have too many open source packages to maintain, like you would have the impression to be fighting them. Uh, so it's rewarding if you have your own package, you will be uh, um, interacting with users and contributors, but it could be time consuming. So that's something to keep in, in mind. If you want other people to uh, interact with you, so you should make your repository a friendly place. Maybe you want to add a contributing guide saying what are your expectations, like in general, how you want people to contribute to your package and uh, do you have any cold start preference? It's good to have a code of conduct as well and maybe a governance file if you want to explain how decisions are made. So I've put the links so there will be uh, an open site com called organized by Stephanie on this uh, very topic. Um, in, a, in a few weeks. Um, and then maybe you can contribute to other existing packages. Maybe that's how you would start uh, contributing to open source. Or maybe that's what you want to do like forever. You want to help, uh, or not forever, but for the timing, that's what you prefer doing uh, in uh, any way. So how would you go about that? So to contribute efficiently to the package of someone else, it, it makes sense to first watch how people interact in this package and what's the contributing guide, but really watching to get a feeling for how things are done. And maybe you would start opening your first issue, opening your first pull request. Uh, and how would you choose a package uh, to contribute to? So criteria could be that's the package you use, the things it use are part of your skill set. It has room for my external contribution, like because otherwise your pull request would stay uh, um, like uh, ignored forever and where your work is valued. So you have two examples of what would be valued, but that's mostly like, you know, people saying uh, thank you. So uh, at our open side, <laughs> Stephanie and Steffi, so Stephanie Betton and Steffi Lazarty uh, uh, wrote this blog post, for instance, for thanking the our open side uh, community for their involvement with our open side in um, 2020. So that means that our open side values the work of contributors and the contributors uh, then uh, field values. So that's an important part of uh, how to choose where to put your efforts. 
I have also an example of a tweet sent by uh, Hadley Wickham to thank Christophe Dervieux for his time uh, helping uh, people with their issues and making pull requests throughout the tidy version Alib repositories. Um, the problem with contributing to other pa the packages of other pe people, especially as an R lady, you know, because there is a lack of R ladies as package developers. If you contribute, depending on how big your contribution, it may be you, your name won't be on the package. Maybe your name will only be in the change log. So in that case, how do you display your skills as a package developer? So that's um, a question that important. So maybe you should write blog posts or give talks about things you've contributed to because the packages itself wouldn't have your name on it. Uh, and uh, that was a very brief presentation, <laughs> good because it's time to end the meetup in any case, but that's a complex topic. So I've put links to further resources on the topic. So the book, Working in Public by Nana Ekbal, the contributing guide, the Open Site Contributing Guide by Stephanie Button and Seth Lazzotti. Stephanie, I'm not saying this just because you're here. That's a very um, uh, good contributing guide. And uh, the Open Site Collaborating Guide in the Open Site Dev Guide has some tips uh, on how to collaborate with people in your own packages. That's all for this. Today, I want to thank you all for listening. And I want to thank Alice East Lansing and Chicago for organizing, in particular, Janani, with whom I was in contact. And I wish you happy our package development. And I can answer questions now. Well, not many. <laughs> thank you so much, Maya. That was a brilliant introduction to our package development. Thank you. And we are hearing a lot of high praises in the chat too, in case you don't have time to read them later on. <laughs> Thank you. So does anyone else have questions? Uh, raise your hands, throw your questions into the chat. In fact, Miles specifically mentioned that she loves the discussion and Q&A part of any meetup. So please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We will keep the Google Doc open for editing for at least a couple of days more. So if you have questions, please throw them in. If you just think of it after you take a nap or something, and we can request Mile to answer them over the weekend, and then I will log the document early next week. I'll post the link to the Google document as well as the video, video presentation to the GitHub repository. So if any of you want to come back when you're actually developing your own package and want to revise on your notes, it will be available. We see a lot of people who have attended, not just from the US, but from Africa, Europe, and everywhere else. Uh, thanks so much. We appreciate the audience have been very interactive and asking a whole bunch of questions. Thanks to you all too. Um, please sign up um, on Meetup for our uh, subsequent events. We have fun with R coming up in April. And well, we'll stay on for a few more questions. But this is my official thank you to Mayal once again. Thanks. OK, it seems like it's become quiet. Yes, I will. I will log off and look at the call. Oh, no, 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 no problem. Thank you so much, Mayal. We really appreciate this. Thank you. It was great fun. And good luck, Janani, you for your talk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, time to close it out.